Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Reducing Readmissions with Personalized Post-Acute Care Navigation. On behalf of of Becker's Healthcare, thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, I'm going to walk through a few quick housekeeping instructions. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log in to today's webinar to access the recording. If at any time you don't see your slides moving or have trouble with the audio, try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box. We are here to help. With that, I'm pleased to welcome today's speakers, Mohammed Saeed. Dr. Saeed is the CMO of Health at Scale and before joining the company was an engineering scientist for Philips Healthcare. Dr. Saeed completed his medical degree at Harvard Medical School as well as Master of Engineering and Doctorate degrees in Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We also have Elizabeth Berger with us. Elizabeth is the Director of Growth at Health at Scale and was previously a Senior Product Manager at SIAPS, Change Healthcare, and Relay Health. Elizabeth holds a BSc in Biomedical Engineering from Brown University and an MBA from the Wharton School in Healthcare Management. Mohammed and Elizabeth, thank you both for being here today. And Elizabeth, I'll turn the floor over to you. Great, thanks Gabby. Uh, today we'll be talking about personalized post-acute care navigation, and we'll discuss the results of two recently published studies on the impact that using machine learning-based provider guidance can have on reducing patient readmissions. Um, but before we dive into the discussion with Dr. Saeed, I'm going to start us off by introducing Health at Scale, uh, tell you a little bit about who we are as a company and some of the work that we've done in the healthcare machine learning space to optimize for patient outcomes. Um, so here is the two of us again. Um, so Health at Scale, we were founded in 2015 um, by a group of award-winning machine learning and clinical faculty. And today we work with health plans, employers, and provider groups um, and serve somewhere in the order of tens of millions of members uh, to help optimize care decisions. Uh, we've been recognized for innovations in healthcare machine intelligence by a number of different groups. And then here on the left, you see our headquarters in San Jose, California, which we'll soon be going back into the office uh, to enjoy. Um, as a company, our mission is to en enable precision delivery for every patient. And by precision delivery, we mean something that's a little bit different from precision medicine, which is a term that's really widely used. Um, but instead of focusing on developing drugs that are specific to an individual, we're focused on identifying the next best action for each individual patient to help optimize their outcomes. And that next best action could be the choice of a treatment. It could be the timing and site of service of a procedure. It could be highlighting which individuals are rising in risk and identifying the best way to outreach to them. Um, or it could be identifying the choice of a provider that's best for the patient at hand, which is what we'll be talking about today. Our approach is deeply, deeply personalized to the individual at hand. Um, such that when we provide guidance for one patient, it's different from the guidance we provide to another patient. And that's based on looking at thousands of different healthcare characteristics for each individual. Um, you see a number of our products here on the slide. These are all really unified by a common machine intelligence platform that was designed with the challenges of healthcare data in mind uh, to really be able to solve for all of the difficulties that we encounter in that data and still be able to um, provide guidance that optimizes outcomes for each individual. Um, so today we're here to discuss our work in optimizing provider choice for patients at discharge to help reduce readmissions and enable optimal outcomes. And to start, I want to dig into our precision navigation product a little bit, um, as that's the product that helps to guide patients to the best provider for them. Um, and ultimately we built this product because we saw that there was a challenge in finding a provider that was best for me and that other ways of doing this in the industry 
were really more focused on identifying either a global provider that was supposedly best for everyone or using process-based metrics to try to opt to try to um, estimate uh, quality for providers. And um, we know that provider outcomes vary from patient to patient. And so we didn't feel like either of these approaches really was truly personalized down to the patient level. Um, we know that when patients are well matched to providers, that helps to avoid ED visits, avoid long ICU stays, comorbidity development, and other adverse outcomes. So we know how important it is to um, find the best provider for each individual and ultimately decided to, to build a solution to help to do that. Digging into the problem a little bit further quickly, um, a growing body of research has really come together to demonstrate that widely used process metrics actually don't correlate to outcomes. Similarly to consumer ratings, reputation rankings, volume, and centers of excellence, none of these methods have really been able to optimize outcomes for an individual. Um, a little bit more recently, a few months ago, this issue was magnified by the New York Times when they investigated the star rating systems for skilled nursing facilities. I'm sure many of you have read this article, um, but it was really interesting and astounding to see what problems they uncovered, even at facilities that had five out of five stars. Um, it was pretty alarming because these are the ratings that oftentimes patients use to navigate to skilled nursing facilities or their providers use to help them navigate there. Um, and just want to show that we really need another way and better tools to help patients to navigate to post-acute care and then also other providers. We also did our own internal analyses, looking at our own data to assess what percentage of patients were well-matched versus suboptimally matched to providers across a number of different specialties. Um, here we have primary care, skilled nursing facilities, home health agencies, orthopedic surgery, cardiology, and oncology. And across the board, we saw that patients were typically well-matched somewhere between 17 to 32% of the time to a provider that was really best for them, um, leaving a really significant opportunity for improvement across all of these specialties that span somewhere between 68% for primary care to 83% for oncology, um, and really shows that there's a lot to be improved in patient to provider matching. And going along with that, a lot to be improved in terms of avoiding adverse outcomes like readmissions. Um, so digging into some of the studies that we've done specifically on precision navigation and using that as an option to help navigate to providers, I first want to start with an example of how this works to make it a little bit more tangible. Um, so in this example here, we have two patients, John and Jane Doe. They live at the little blue house in the middle of this geography, perhaps their neighbors in this example. And though they have the same presenting complaint of palpitations and abdominal pain, they really under the covers are very different patients. They are different ages, different genders. They have a whole host of different conditions that they're living with. They're on a different set of medications. And all of these pieces are very important in terms of uh, determining which providers they should go to see, which courses of treatment they should receive. And so um, how precision navigation works is it will first profile these two patients to understand them. Then it will look at all the providers that are available to them in their area and in their insurance network. And it will make a match from the patient to each provider to assess what are the outcomes likely to be if this patient goes to this provider. And what it's looking for are optimal outcomes or put another way avoidance of adverse outcomes like ED visits and post-procedure um, admissions and hospitalizations. And based on that, it will help to create a ranking of the top providers in the patient's area that then they can go to. So in this example, patient John Toe is recommended to go to provider B, C, or E, whereas Jane Doe is suggested that she go to provider A, C, or F. Um, and then moving on to some of what we've seen with our analyses, we used precision navigation and looked at a set of national Medicare beneficiaries. 
Um, so in this instance, we looked at skilled nursing facilities. In the next few slides, I'll talk through home health agencies and then a couple of other specialties that we looked at. But what we did here is we looked at which patients did go to a skilled nursing facility that was recommended for them specifically based on their unique healthcare needs. And then we looked at those who didn't go to those top facilities for them and compared the outcomes. And ultimately across the board, we saw the outcomes were improved for patients who did go to the SNPs that were a good match for them across uh, reduced length of stay, reduced 30 day and 90 day readmissions and reduced 30 day and 90 day ED visits. Similarly with home health agencies, we did the same experiment. We looked at patients who went to home health agencies that were a good match for them versus those that did not and then assessed the difference in outcomes for those two groups. And again, we found that 30 day, 90 day readmissions and 30 day and 90 day ED visits were reduced for the patients who did go to the home health agencies that were a good match for them. Lastly, just to quickly touch on a couple of other specialties that we looked at. Ultimately, we looked at 20 some odd specialties, but just highlighting one internal medicine and, and one surgical specialty. Uh, we looked at cardiology and orthopedic surgery. Again, same experiment, patients who went to cardiologists or orthopedic surgeons who were optimal for them versus those that did not. And we continued to see a really significant uh, decrease in 30 day and 90 day admissions, as well as 30 day and um, in this case, 180 day ED visits. Okay, so with that in mind, um, I'm gonna turn it over to our discussion. Today, we're here to focus on a couple of peer reviewed studies that again, investigate precision navigation's effect on um, improving outcomes. And I'm going to move on by uh, asking Dr. Saeed a couple of questions about the papers. So um, to get started, um, Dr. Saeed, can you give a quick overview of what you investigated in each study and why perhaps starting with uh, this JMIR paper and ultimately starting with this paper, what were the most exciting or surprising results that you saw? Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, really happy to be here today. So, you know, uh, we were really excited about our publication, JMAR, uh, where we focused on uh, looking at uh, using precision navigation to uh, identify the right orthopedic surgeons uh, for procedure. Um, and in this case, what we looked at is it was a comparative performance where we said, well, you know, we have precision navigation, which is our machine learning based approach that in summary, as you noted earlier, it uh, characterizes each patient in a very personalized manner by looking at uh, their prior history, uh, their comorbidities, their prior uh, cardiac, uh, their prior uh, medical events, such as hospitalizations or things like that. And then we use that to build a picture, a very personalized picture of each patient. But then on, not only that, but with, pre with precision navigation, we also can build a, a model, a predictive model for each orthopedic surgeon uh, in the geography. So for this study, we looked at the greater Chicago metropolitan area, and we looked at, we built uh, predictive models for each orthopedic surgeon that looks at their prior historical uh, longitudinal outcomes for the patients that they've seen, the patient courts they've seen. And for, with those, we can build models that can then take as input new patients that are being considered. And from that, we can generate a ranking of for any given patient, who are the best. Uh, in this case, we actually looked at hospital level instead of just at orthopedic surgeon, one orthopedic surgeon, we can also build these models at an entire hospital level and say, what is the right hospital for this given patient for uh, orthopedic surgery procedure? Uh, for example, like a total hip replacement. And what we did with that is we looked at, well, what about different types of rating approaches? For example, US News, Health Grades, Yelp, um, which are other popular consumer techniques that folks might use for picking uh, a hospital for performing orthopedic surgery. Then on top of that, we compared some of the more 
uh, process-based metrics, for example, using the CMS star ratings for a hospital or looking at the average volume of a hospital or even the average outcome at a hospital. And then we said, okay, well, if people picked the right hospital based off of one of these consumer ratings or process ratings, how did they do compared to picking the right hospital based off of the health and scale precision navigation approach? And what we saw uniformly here was that when we looked at, for example, 90-day ED admission rates following orthopedic surgery or hospitalization rate, or even 90-day total costs of care, we showed that the health at scale precision navigation approach was better than these other techniques. Uh, so there was about a 16 to 7, almost 16 to 18% reduction in readmission uh, and post-procedure hospitalization rates. Uh, there was a significant reduction in the total costs of care uh, of the um, patients who use precision navigation. And when you look at other techniques, some of them actually had an increase in total costs of care or had uh, a increase in hospitalization rates or ED, ED visit rates. So this is a comparative performance saying, well, how does precision navigation approach uh, you uh, compared to other techniques? And we showed here that I was actually superior. Great. And um, I guess digging into this a little bit further, which of these results did you think was the most surprising? Well, you know, I think that um, one of the interesting things we found here, you know, I'm not sure I would call it surprising, but we did see, for example, that some of the places that um, are considered top based off of, you know, uh, consumer approaches actually had an increase in total cost of care. Um, and that's not surprising because some of these reputational scores, you know, they use that in trying to attract patients and that can actually influence their pricing and things like that. Um, so that's one interesting finding. So, uh, but we found that we had a dramatically uh, uh, improved total cost of care compared to the other techniques. So if you look at that uh, red bar at the bottom, you see that we actually had a $3,300 reduction compared to the average, um, uh, the population average, whereas other techniques had either from a $1,300 increase to about a $1,000 decrease. But we are at least 3x better than the next closest uh, technique, which I thought was very impressive. But it's not only total cost of care that we, we, uh, we reduce, but we also reduce the um, ED admission rate and the hospitalization rate. And that's actually a very consistent picture because when people go to the hospital after an orthopedic surgery, that's where the costs really start ballooning. And so if you get better outcomes, lower complication rates, that translates into longer uh, savings in terms of total cost of care. So it's a very consistent message. And we saw that here in this study. So it was, you know, we were hoping to see this and we were, you know, it was a very pleasant surprise. It was a very pleasant finding to show that in fact, we had that kind of consistent performance, both from in terms of outcomes, hard outcomes like hospitalization in ER, as well as, you know, how that affects the, you know, the, the, the wallet in terms of total cost of care. That's great. And, uh, you know, really important as organizations move to value-based models, but then also uh, for patients who, or providers who are helping patients to choose where they might get something like a, a hip surgery done. Um, and then moving on to the next paper, uh, the next study that, that you dug into this past year that was reviewed and published in the American Journal of Managed Care. Um, can you talk at a high level at what you investigated here? So the, you know, HAMC, we were really excited about this paper because, you know, we published this during the, the middle of the uh, COVID or the, actually the earlier parts of the COVID pandemic. And we've tried to focus on uh, respiratory infections and how important they are for the Medicare population in particular. Um, and we looked at two different, we did two different studies that uh, were uh, basically analyzed and included in this paper. Um, one is we looked at um, from, a from the uh, 
community dwelling settings. So people who are in ambulatory outpatient settings, uh, you know, Medicare beneficiaries, could we identify who was the highest risk in that group? So basically looking at their 12 months of past administrative claims data, could we identify who was at high risk of presenting to the hospital for a respiratory related infection? Uh, so we built a very specialized personalized machine learning model. And we showed that with this, we could risk stratify patients uh, based upon their uh, likelihood of having uh, basically within the next 90 days, a higher risk of ED or hospitalization for, uh, from respiratory infections. Um, and then we looked at the, um, in the other part of the study, we looked at uh, folks who had um, basically been in the hospital and what was, if we sent them to the right skilled nursing facility, because this is a big problem. When, when you have patients hospitalized for respiratory infections, and sometimes they're very prolonged hospitalizations, what you do in the hospital uh, is important, but also what you do in the post-acute care setting, particularly if these patients need to go to a skilled nursing facility, picking the right skilled nursing facility to reduce their risk of having complications that land them right back in the hospital or right back in the ER uh, is a very important choice that uh, a decision that needs to be made uh, at the time of discharge. So those discharge coordinators in the hospitals and healthcare systems, that is a very vital decision about where they send these patients. So often there's not much direction on where these patients go to. And you know, sometimes people look at just CMS star ratings, but as you showed in that earlier uh, slide where New York Times showed that using these star ratings, they could be gained. And you can wind up with really impressive looking CMS star ratings, but underneath it, there could be a disaster in terms of what's really going on at a skilled nursing facility. But using our quantitative approaches of looking at the real outcomes in skilled nursing facilities, and look at how those outcomes change based upon the types of patients that were basically processed through that skilled nursing facility over you know historical period of time. And then having a personalized characterization of each new patient as they're being presented as, well, I'm about to discharge my patient from the hospital and I have 10 or 20 different skilled nursing facilities, which one do I go to? So we show that actually, if we send patients to a skilled nursing facility that is top recommended based upon our machine learning uh, model, um, that they had lower ED rates, they had lower hospitalization rates compared to going to non-top recommended. And it's a dramatic difference you can see. You, you dropped, uh, from 8.7% to 5.5% ED rates. You draw from 6.1% to 3.9% in hospitalization rates. And, you know, these are very important things because that not only are those just numbers, that, but that means that these patients avoided complications, that they're able to get home earlier to their families. And it also does translate into improved total cost of care down the road. So it's really a win-win-win. It's a win for the patients and they, they get better care at the right skilled nursing facility. It's a win for the hospital in the sense that they avoid having patients present back for uh, within you know, a 30-day readmission. And it's uh, a win from a payer perspective in that they also reduce their total cost of care. So that's, it's, it's, it's a great uh, approach to try to get a way where we not only improve outcomes, but we also improve total cost of care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, just thinking about everyone this past year whose family members were maybe in skilled nursing facilities or needed to go to skilled nursing facilities, this offers a really great tool for people to feel more confident in where they're going or where they're sending their family members. Um, so that's really exciting. And then uh, on predicting the high risk patients piece, I know we're not spending a lot of time on that today. Um, but Health at Scale's Precision Interception product is able to help, you know, even further identify which patients maybe need uh, outreach or, or need more of a, a handheld approach. 
in terms of their care. So we can answer questions on that um, as they come up later. But digging into a little bit further, all the results that we've talked about so far and uh, this huge need in the SNF navigation space. I know that precision navigation originally started as a SNF navigation tool. This was really the first use case that you worked on um, and has since expanded to 20 some odd different specialties that you know, we talked about a little bit, um, as well as navigating patients by procedures that they're you know, specifically looking for. But uh, going back to kind of the origins of this product, why did you start with the SNF navigation use case? Was it just because there was the most need there or for other reasons? Well, it's a very challenging problem, first of all. You know, when you look at um, the amount of money that's spent in the Medicare population, uh, there is a big chunk of that that's basically focused on post-acute care management. And what's important to realize is that also that's where there is a huge variable cost, which means that the right decisions can have a dramatic effect on better outcomes and better you know, health care, uh, economics and total costs of care in the sense that that's a, it's a very important problem. Um, and it's a big challenge to the healthcare system. So, you know, as a company we were founded in 2015 and we tried to look at where were there opportunities where for, um, you know, basically having important, you know, big change in healthcare delivery, we thought of, post acute care as a great space to start in. And we worked with a payer that was particularly interested in trying to get their patients to the right post acute care settings. But, you know, as, as you mentioned, you know, post acute care is just one piece of the puzzle and it's still a, a continuum of navigation. So, you know, you know, although I'm a cardiologist right now in my former life, I was also a hospitalist. And I can't tell you the number of times that as a hospitalist, when I'm discharging my patients, even if they do not go to a, they do not need a skilled nursing facility. Many times I've seen hospitals where the first time they've actually had an encounter of the health system or, or healthcare workers in five to 10 years has been during their hospitalization. They don't, they don't have a primary care provider. They don't have a specialist. You know, there could be people who come in for the first time with rip roar and heart failure They've never seen a cardiologist in their life. They've not even seen a primary care specialist for the last five or 10 years. These folks I'm very worried about when I'm discharging them. They may be safe enough to go home, but if we don't uh, take care of them in the post-acute care or the post-hospitalization, they may present right back. So that's where it led us into this idea of saying, well, not only do we need to match them to the right skilled nursing facilities, but we got to make sure these folks have the right doctors, the right uh, primary care providers, the right cardiologists, the right orthopedic surgeons, you know, all these different specialties. Um, and it, it's that level of completing the continuum as you had that in one of your first slides, we talked about all the different points in, uh, along the continuum where you can make an in intervention to help patients with their healthcare delivery. It's, it's just a continuum from post-acute care, primary care, specialist care, uh, those are all very important points. It's it's very difficult to actually prioritize one over the other. And that's why today we are really having full-fledged efforts at all these different approaches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting that um, the point of discharge, you know, for some patients is a trigger point or an important inflection point to keeping them on to the right care pathway, making sure that they stay healthy. But then for others, it's maybe their only interaction with the health system for many, many years, and maybe the only opportunity that the health system has to really in, inflect and, uh, you know, continue to try and get them onto the right care pathway, make sure they are going to see the right PCP for, for them, make sure that they are, um, you know, referred to the right specialists for them uh, so that they don't show up yeah. in, in another five years in the hospital. Yeah, exactly. I could tell you the, the prior paradigm I mean, I can still remember this is on my discharge note, it would simply, you know, we have a, a pull down menu, we can select the statement. In the past, it would just say, please see a doctor or primary care provider in the next two weeks. And that's about it. With this type of technology, especially that it can be embedded within EHR, 
we can we can not only tell them please see a primary care provider or a heart failure doctor in the next couple of weeks, but we can actually tell them who to see and give them that kind of guidance um, so that we can really get them going on the right uh, direction when they're being discharged from the hospital. Yeah. Of course, this and this doesn't just apply to people in the hospital. It, all of that is a very important area. You know, it's for people who've not been hospitalized. These are also decisions they wrestle with every single day. So people who are trying to, you know, they've moved to a new community. They got to pick a new doctor. They got to pick a new specialist. These types of tools can be very valuable. So they can be valuable to keep people from ever getting to hospital in the first place to taking care of people who've been hospitalized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And that brings me to one of my next questions, which is on how providers have responded to um, thinking about referrals using a machine learning based tool, because I imagine that some providers maybe would be skeptical about using a tool like this. Um, Maybe they have other providers that they're already referring to that they feel more comfortable with. But then on the flip side, from what you just said, and, and you know, your previous pull down um, at, at point of discharge, which is pretty generic, I imagine there are a bunch of providers that might welcome this guidance to really be able to help their patient get to the best provider for them. Um, so what have you seen, I guess, in, in your work and working with other providers in terms of appetite to adopt a solution like precision navigation? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, um, you know, to your point, um, I would say that there are some providers who, you know, they have their own network of folks they want to send people to, and they may be skeptical and they want to stick to that approach. And, you know, that's up to them. Um, this is a, a clinical decision support tool. It can, but it's really a myth to think that all providers are very specific in their referrals. I can tell you that when I make a referral for even within the health system I work with, that I would say 70, 80% of the time, I don't refer to a specific uh, specialist. I say, you need to see a gastroenterologist. You need to see an orthopedic surgeon. I don't really get into saying which orthopedic surgeon you have to to see. So, you know, for a lot of providers, having that decision support such that uh, you not only can make a general recommendation that you need to see a primary care or you need to see a specialist, but then have a choice of people that are likely best matched to this patient, I think is something that should be welcomed by many providers. Ultimately, you know, the the thing that's going to, you know, I can tell you as a physician, what we care most about are outcomes for our patients. Are we getting our patients to the right providers? Are those uh, decisions that we're making, uh, improving their quality of life and having them live longer. That really is the most important thing. And as this technology is being utilized more and more, and we're showing that it is indeed effective that folks who go to the right providers that are best matched for them do have better outcomes, do stay out of the ER, do stay out of the hospital. Um, and we optimize for those. We're not trying to get you the cheapest provider. We optimize for getting you the best outcomes. And we think if we get you the best outcomes, you get that improvement in total cost of care as an added benefit. Because again, it's, it's that consistent story, keeping people out of the hospital, keeping people out of the ER, will translate into long-term uh, improvement in total cost of care. And these are the things that providers care about as payers care about it, as well as healthcare systems care about. Great. Um, And, you know, we talked a lot about how important it is to really enable provider guidance that's at an individual level that is specific so that uh, patients know where they should go next. We know that patients really do rely on their providers for referrals and, and follow that guidance. And so it's a really good opportunity to kind of make sure that the patient is going to the best person for them. Um, and with all of this kind of research to support that personalization really does improve outcomes. Um, why do you think that this isn't being done more widely across the industry? Like why, why are people still leveraging process-based metrics instead of focusing more on outcomes, focusing more on individual outcomes? Um, and 
I guess, is that based on, uh, is it a technology problem? Do you think it's a data problem? Is it more of like a, a workflow and traditions problem? What do you think there? Well, I mean, it's, it's all of the above. You know, I think that from, um, you know, a workflow and traditions perspective, you know, that's sort of how things have been done in the past. Um, but, you know, as we um, are starting to liberate more and more data, um, these challenges are going to come at us like a tidal wave. So it's not only just a problem for the uh, provider when they're doing referrals. You know, that example of uh, a provider for in, in um, you know, who might be 200, 300 miles away from academic medical center, mm -hmm. referring a patient to an academic medical center or a, a bigger healthcare system, then it, then the, um, the challenge becomes to the healthcare system that gets that referral, how do they then channel that and make sure that that patient that got, gets referred to them sees the, right pay, sees the right provider? So that then becomes a challenge for the healthcare system. Um, and this becomes a, a big problem because now are they gonna do it just based off of scheduling or are they gonna have some kind of, uh, you know, basically system with, um, real automation, real intelligence, real personalization that looks at this patient that's being referred to them. And the healthcare system now knows a lot about how the providers within the healthcare system have done on their prior uh, encounters. Using this kind of intelligence that we have at Health at Scale, they can make sure that that match is the right match. Um, it's a difficult problem for a healthcare system to figure that out on their own because it's very sophisticated machine learning to make that kind of match and, and readings. Um, but as machine learning and data uh, analytics technologies have evolved, these are becoming more and more possible. And I'd like to think that we at Health at Scale are really out in the forefront in coming up with these types of innovative algorithms that allow healthcare systems to make better utilization of their data so that they could do this with administrative claims data, they could do this with EHR data that they have in, in basically in data warehouses to unlock the potential information that can be helped, that can be really fastened into a, a great clinical decision support tool. Uh, and that's where we can help them. Great. Uh, so that brings me to my last question for today before I turn it over to the audience for any Q&A there. Um, but if you have one piece of advice to the healthcare organizations in the audience around making a decision to adopt machine learning um, within their healthcare solutions, what would it be? So I think biggest piece of advice I'd have is um, think about how the decision-making your, your, or a clinical decision sports tool can improve the outcomes for your patients and give them that great experience. Um, a tool that really um, is as seamless as when folks go to Amazon to pick products or uh, you know, go to Google to do searches. Uh, if you can build that kind of experience, but optimize on not finding the right web page, but finding the right doctor for your, for your, your, for your uh, patients and your members. Uh, having that kind of seamless experience is now possible. And you really have to start thinking bold about this and thinking about how doing, you know, really being at the forefront of adopting these kind of technologies will lead you to better outcomes and make you uh, able to use quantitative information to make your, the, improve the quality of life for your patients. Um, and I think that's an important thing. Rather than being held, you know, slave to, I got to stick to a process, think more about outcomes. Great. Thank you so much. Gabby, I'll turn it over to you for the audience Q&A. Great. Thank you, Mohammed and Elizabeth, for that great presentation. Um, we will now begin today's question and answer session. So you can submit any questions you have by typing them into the Q&A chat box on your webinar console. Um, let's get started with our first question today. It looks like an audience member would like to know, 
how do you deploy and integrate the solution at a health system? And can you integrate into the EHR or discharge workflow? Great question. So uh, we have several deployment, uh, you know, de de deployment methods. So one is we have a cloud-based solution where we are in the cloud and you can have access, you know, via very secure cloud uh, connectivity uh, with, within your healthcare system to our cloud and have uh, basically very secure transmission of uh, patient information that would allow us to characterize patients and then send you uh, results back that you can then embed you know, via like an API type process. And that would be more of a cloud-based solution. We also have on-premises solution where we actually deploy our technology within your own intranet or cloud within the healthcare system. So your data never leaves your cloud. And that can then be embedded with any applications, whether they're web-based applications within the healthcare system, or in fact, they can actually, to follow, answer the last part, yes, they can actually be embedded within an EHR so that it becomes integrated with the workflow so that when they basically press a button uh, during their discharge navigator uh, on a discharge navigator screen, there would be a health at scale app that would help them, for example, identify who are the right doctors for the patients to see in the post-acute care setting, who are, where are the right skilled nursing facilities for those patients to go to, um, or also identify things like risk those patients may have of having, um, you know, post-discharge uh, uh, hospitalizations or ER visits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one thing I would add here is just that we know that that last 1.2, that last 0.2 miles is really the hardest and that um, these solutions, you can have the best algorithms in the business, but if nobody's using them, they're not making any difference. And so we've been really focused on making sure that when we do launch with customers, we are integrated into a workflow that they're using, um, make sure that they are equipped to understand the outputs and, and how to use the guidance uh, so that it does get used and it, it really does have an impact on uh, patient outcomes. Great, thank you both so much for those answers. Um, another audience member would like to know, what data sources do you use when you launch with a customer? So for building, uh, for building our predictive models, we actually have our own data sources for uh, providers, for hospitals, uh, and th these are you know over 100 million uh, patient lives uh, for the better part of close to a decade in terms of longitudinal outcomes information along various lines of business. Uh, so we use our own models, uh, our own data sources for building these predictive models. Now to uh, look at the patients that are being presented to us, we would be relying on information that would then be sent to us from a payer or provider. Uh, and that kind of information could include administrative claims data, or in fact, could include EHR type data. And we would use that to build the personalized characterization of the patient that would then be fed into the predictive models for uh, the providers that, that of interest within the geography. Thanks, Mohammed. Another audience member wants to know, do you launch navigation for all patients or just those that are at highest risk? And how do you identify the highest risk patients? So we can use navigation for all patients. All patients. Uh, so for example, somebody moved to a new community and they're looking for establishing care, picking a new primary care doctor. So that would be a great example, somebody that could use our precision navigation to find the right PCP or find the right cardiologist. Um, and it's, you know, these are very stable folks. We can also do this for people who are, um, you know, being discharged from a hospital. And so they may be higher risk because they just had an acute, uh, healthcare encounter, and they're at higher risk of having readmissions and ER visits. So in that setting, you can use uh, our navigation tool to help you with both picking wh whether you need a skilled nurse nursing facility, whether you need a home healthcare agency, or whether you need a, to pick a new provider 
uh, in terms of a uh, primary care or a specialist. Um, and in terms of how to, you know, look at people with risk, you know, that's an area that we talked to briefly about in um, our um, interception piece where we have used machine learning to identify who are the highest risk patients. So based upon their prior healthcare encounters, who is at high risk of having a ER visit, hospitalization, or an escalation in their chronic diseases. So for example, somebody with diabetes, but that diabetes is not being well managed um, and they may be at risk for having things like diabetic nephropathy, or which is you know, diabetic kidney disease or diabetic retinopathy, diabetic eye disease, if their diabetes is not well controlled. So if we can identify those types of high-risk patients based upon their rising risk trajectory, then that should also prompt outreach coordinators to say, hey, these folks are going in the wrong direction. How do we get them to go in the right direction? So one of the things is to make sure that they see the right doctors and the right facilities. And that's where you can use our navigation tool to, as a follow-up to the interception tool to make sure that they get the right care at the right time to have a trajectory that is better for their long-term outcomes. This next question has to deal with the outcomes as well. What outcomes do you look at as part of your outcomes-based navigation? So, you know, a couple of the most important outcomes we looked at is how do we keep people out of the hospital? So that's either hospitalization rates, so hospital admissions, um, and uh, emergency room visits. Um, so these are two of the more important outcomes that we look at. Um, on top of that, we also looked at, uh, for example, the uh, how does a person's chronic disease escalate over time as an outcome? Is it If it's escalating over time, that means that it's a worrisome trajectory, and we try to optimize to ensure that the outcomes, uh, ensure that the uh, chronic disease, in fact, does not get worse over time. Uh, and that's, you know, that'd be a flavor of the type of outcomes that we're interested in. And lastly, in the last few minutes here, um, when you identify a provider match for a patient, are you matching the patient to a specific physician or to a facility or both? Elizabeth, do you wanna answer that? Sure. So. Um, in some cases, we're doing both. In some cases, it's to a specific physician. Um, it kind of depends on the uh, customer. We've typically launched to match patients to a specific physician for them. Um, that can be based on them looking for an orthopedic surgeon to an earlier example, or their PCP helping them to navigate to an orthopedic surgeon. Um, it could be done through procedure. So a patient who knows that they need a hernia repair um, could look for providers who do hernia repair or uh, back to the orthopedic surgery example, someone who needs a hand surgery could navigate to surgeons that specifically focus on hand surgeries and for the types of patients that are similar you know, to the one who's seeking a physician. Um, so we can do it at, at the physician level um, thinking back to the paper that we mentioned in JMIR, that was based on the hospital level. Um, we've also been asked to do some work looking at the best side of service for a patient at hand. So taking into account, should this patient get a surgery or a procedure done in an inpatient environment because perhaps they're higher risk, or are they going to be okay to get that done in an ambulatory or outpatient environment um, and, and still able to optimize their outcomes. So we're able to kind of do it across the spectrum there. I don't know if there's anything you would add, Mohammed. I think that's fantastic. Well, great. Thank you both so much. That is all the time we have today. But again, I want to thank Mohammed and Elizabeth for that excellent presentation and Health at Scale for sponsoring today's webinar. To learn more about the content presented today, please check out the resources section on your webinar console and fill out the post webinar survey. Thank you again for joining us today, and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon.